They were prospecting for gold, but instead, they encountered something horrifying. The men had been prospecting the area for six years near Mount St. Helens and the Lewis River in southwest Washington. What led them there was something of another vibration, what they referred to as the Great Spirit. It was a native gentleman who told them to follow the white arrow, and so they did. But during the process, one of the men got angry that he was on a wild goose chase and he didn't want to take part in it anymore and cursed the Great Spirit along the way. Well, when they found their destination, the Great Spirit told them that he would show them the gold, but since they had cursed him along the way, they would never leave with a single ounce. Despite this revelation, for the next six years, the men still pursued the prospect of striking it rich. July of 1924, and the men were working their claim called the Vander White. And real quick, y'all already know the drill. This is for entertainment purposes only. This may or may not be true. This is alleged and has not been proven as absolute fact. Also, I notice in my analytics that 60 to 70% of my viewers aren't subscribed. So if you guys like my content, do me a solid, smash that subscribe button so you can see more of my content and it helps me in the long run. Thank you guys, love y'all. Back to the video. The crew consisted of five miners total but the two leaders were Fred Beck and Hank. It was just a couple miles east of Mount St. Helens in a deep canyon named Ape Canyon. But it wasn't long after they started the adventure that they noticed some odd tracks strewn about the area. They looked like massive feet, bigger than anything they had ever seen. Hank, the one who had cursed the Great Spirit on the way up the mountain, was a great woodsman and an even better hunter. And he had been a little apprehensive since seeing the tracks. They all knew that the tracks belonged to no known animal of the area. And the largest one they had seen was over 19 inches long. What bothered Hank even more is that one day he was going to a sandbar that covered about an acre in the river nearby. This is where they would wash their clothes and their cooking utensils daily. Hank came running excitedly back to camp and told the guys they needed to follow him. They went to the sandbar and there lay two large footprints smack dab in the middle of the sandbar as if the creature had just fallen out of the air there were no other tracks anywhere nearby and this perplexed the men they were absolutely baffled regardless the men continued their work and they would come across the occasional track and hear things outside of their cabin at night but they learned to pay no never mind to it and just continue to search for the gold it was the middle of july 1924 and they had produced a good assay on the current area they were prospecting. Based on the numbers, they believed there was $2,000 worth of gold per ton of earth excavated from the area. This had the men eager and excited. They were ready to produce after six years of prospecting this land. So spirits were high among the group, all except for Fred, who had a terrible toothache at the time. So later that afternoon, right before dinner, he decided he'd ask Hank if he'd take him to town to see a dentist. But Hank pretended he didn't even hear him. He was so enthused about the gold. He finally gave him a quick answer, telling him God nor the devil was going to take him away from there at the time. Unfortunately for Fred, they had all come up there in Hank's Ford. He was his only way to get back to town if he needed it. So, he was stuck. Eventually, they made their way back to the cabin on the north side of the canyon. That night, they made beans and hotcakes for dinner. But Fred wouldn't have any of it because his tooth was nagging him so bad. Hank, though apprehensive, was still determined. They had been hearing noises around their cabin for about a week at that time. And each evening, they would hear a loud shrill from one side of the canyon, and then another would respond from the opposite side of the canyon. These noises would often be accompanied by loud, low thumping, almost a thunderous sound, as if a silverback gorilla was thumping on its chest. After dinner, Hank had asked Fred if he would accompany him to the spring nearby the cabin. It was about 100 yards off and they both decided they should take their rifles just in case. They were just a few yards away from the spring when suddenly Hank yelled, raising his rifle immediately. Fred proceeded to look in the direction he was pointing, and that's when he saw it. It was a hairy, ape-like creature peeking from behind a large pine tree. The beast was about 100 yards away on the other side of the canyon. It quickly dodged behind the pine tree, then peeked its head back out, and that's when Hank took the shot. Then another, then another. Fred watched as the bark on the pine tree went flying, and the beast ran away. I think you grazed it, Fred said. I think you're right, Hank replied. So they quickly grabbed some water from the spring and ran back to camp. Upon returning back to camp, 
They explained to the men what happened down by the creek, and they all agreed that they should leave immediately the next morning, and that if they went tonight, the darkness would fall before they reached the truck, and it wouldn't be good to be caught in the dark by these creatures. Nightfall had found them in their pine log cabin. They had built it years earlier and made it very sturdy. In the cabin, they had one long bunk bed that two men could sleep feet to feet. The rest would sleep in pine bows on the floor. On one end, they had a large fireplace made out of stone. The cabin had no windows. When darkness fell, they smoked on their pipes and eventually lay down to rest, quickly falling asleep. And it was around midnight when Fred sprung out of bed awake. He could hear commotion coming down the hill next to the cabin. He sat there and listened to what sounded like a buck crashing through a thicket, when suddenly, boom, the entire cabin shook. All the men but Hank woke to the thud. And that's when they saw a piece of chinking fall from in between the pine logs from the ceiling onto Hank's chest. As the chinking landed on him, he began thrashing about as if he was having a nightmare. He reached for his rifle. Fred woke him up and explained to him the situation. He seemed startled, but gathered his bearings quickly. Then suddenly, boom, another thunderous blow hit the cabin, shaking it to its core. Then shortly after, a loud, feral cry emanated from the mountain. They instantly knew what it was. It was the apes. They could hear them all around the cabin, even on the roof. The chinking had been knocked loose so they could peer out. They only saw three, but they believed there were many more surrounding them. Fred, quickly thinking, grabbed one of the bunk beds and propped it against the door. And it was just in time, because immediately after, a loud bang, bang, bang. A group of two or three of them were trying to push their way in. That's when the men grabbed the rifles and gave it everything they had. Hank was sporting a semi-automatic Remington, and the rest of the team were shooting lever action 3030s. It wasn't long after bullets started peppering the door that they stopped trying to get in. Then they went to the roof. It sounded like at least three or four of them were slamming their fists trying to get in. Then suddenly, they saw one's hand reach through the cracks in the pines. Immediately, they all pointed their weapons up at the roof and let rounds fly. By the time they had stopped, it was pure silence. The creatures had vacated the roof. The beast attacked them for the rest of the night with only short intervals of quiet in between. They would stop shooting when the beast would stop attacking, hoping they would get the correlation, but it didn't matter. They would try to get into the door a couple more times with it vibrating from the impact. Every time, Hank and Fred would load the door full of lead. They even tried pushing on the walls of the cabin, hoping they could break them down, but that would be impossible as they built it sturdy as could be. Then at one point, one of the beasts reached its hand through the opening between the pine logs and grabbed an ax from inside the cabin. But Fred, thinking on his toes, grabbed the head of the ax and turned it vertical so it couldn't get through the horizontal space between the logs. As it was pulling on it, Hank fired at it again, missing its hand barely. The beast would then drop the ax and pull his hand out. Tax continued the rest of the night, Hank singing the whole time. If you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone, mountain devils. That's what he referred to the seven to ten foot tall beasts as, mountain devils. The next morning came around and daylight broke. They finally let themselves out of the cabin. And sure enough, just 80 yards away, up in the canyon, was one of the beasts. Fred quickly pulled up his rifle and shot at it three times and watched as it fell into the canyon. The men grabbed only the essentials and left everything behind, got to the truck and got out of Dodge. The entire way to the truck, they felt like they were being followed. If it weren't for their rifles, they probably wouldn't have made it that night. And they never went back to what is now called Ape Canyon. Originally, they had all agreed not to say anything, but it wasn't long before Hank let the cat out of the bag and every newspaper in the Mount St. Helens area covered it. It would become a known story nationwide and one of the most notorious encounters with Bigfoot in American history. Authorities would catch wind and investigate the matter. They would only find footprints, but no bodies, and they decided that wasn't enough evidence to validate the story, so it went down as lore.